Help us to become more like Christ. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. To all you dads out there, happy Father's Day. I hope your day is already off to a great start. I know that mine is because almost all of my kids are here in church with me this morning. And uh, I could not be happier about that. Yeah. We're only missing one. My, uh, my middle daughter had to stay in Fort Worth because she's a big girl now. She has a big girl job and she doesn't have very many vacation days. So Delaney, we miss you, but we love you. And uh, so I'm already having a great day because most of my family's here. We're coming off a great week of VBS. We had, we averaged about 130 kids every night of the week, and there were over 200 of you that showed up to serve. That is incredible. I'm so proud of our church. And they, they raised money to um, about $875 to give to Choices Pregnancy Center, a ministry that we partner with, also Families for Families Foster Care. And so I'm so proud of our people, and thank you for loving on our community. And as Clay mentioned, we had one, Trust Christ as their Savior. And so, but there's no tired like VBS tired. And so I know that some of you are still in recovery mode, uh, but I appreciate you, and I'm so thankful for your service this, uh, this last week. Well, today we conclude a three-part series entitled Fathers of the Faith. We started a few weeks ago taking a look at Jairus, who was a fearful father. Jairus uh, was facing the death of his 12-year-old daughter. He didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what to do. So he did what every wise father does. He went and he found Jesus, and he brought Jesus to his house. And Jesus flips the script, doesn't he, on our circumstances. And Jairus chose faith over fear. And then last week, we looked at a faulty father. We took a look at King David. And while King David is a man of renown, he's just a man. And even the best of men are men at best. And he made some mistakes in his life. And uh, he, he had some sins, and it affected his sons. And then ultimately, though, he was saved by the fact that he threw himself Every time he he fell, every time he failed, he threw himself on the grace and mercy of God. And because of that, God said, here's a man after my own heart. And so I challenged uh, all of us, but especially fathers, to throw yourself on the mercy of God. Fail forward. If you fall down, pick something up, right? And move forward. And so today we're going to conclude our series, Fathers of the Faith, looking at God, our forever Father. It's only appropriate, right? Because God is our Father. It's the way we're supposed to refer to Him throughout the Scriptures. We're told that. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I would agree with that statement. And that how we view God affects the way we live our lives. Sociologists say that it's common for people to perceive what God is like based on the fatherly figures in their lives. In other words, if dad is caring, patient, concerned, then children will believe that God has those same characteristics. But this is difficult for some of you because some of you had an abusive or an absent or an ambivalent father. Uh, So many of you view God because of that as cruel, controlling, You see him as a vindictive deity or a detached passive power uh, that's out there somewhere, but he's not really involved in your life and he's not really concerned with your life. Some of you grew up with a dad who was like Ward Cleaver from Leave it to Beaver. How many Leave it to Beaver fans out there? Okay, you go way back with me. All right. Or maybe your dad was like Danny Tanner from Full House. Always ready to have a, a, a good conversation, a good listener. Uh, Maybe he had a dad like Bill Cosby from The Cosby Show. Maybe he was fun. He liked to have a good time, but he would would weave life truths uh, into fun moments. And so maybe you had a a great experience as a father, but uh, some of you, I've heard from young families with little kids now that there's a great cartoon out there called Bluey, and that Bandit, Bluey's dad, is actually a pretty good example of a good dad who who is involved. And so that's great. There's some good examples uh, that were put out there for us, but there's also some bad examples. Maybe you grew up with a dad like Archie Bunker. Do you guys remember (laughs) Archie Bunker? All in the family, and he had a chair, you know, and you dare not sit in his chair. Maybe your dad was more like Homer Simpson. Not not that animated, but, you know, Homer Simpson. Uh, Maybe your dad was like Al Bundy from Married with Children. Sorry about that. Um, but maybe, maybe you're like Luke Skywalker, and you had a dad like Darth Vader. Can you imagine that? 
having a dad like Darth Vader, a guy that wants to dominate the universe, who, who force pushes people and chokes them from a distance. I mean, that would be horrible to have a dad like that. I mean, how would you view God if Darth Vader were your dad? But think about it. People that, that have a certain kind of a dad view God in a certain kind of way. Think about this. People that hate their dad are a lot like atheists. Atheists prefer that, that their dad didn't even exist, that God did not even exist. And they spend a lot of time and energy trying to explain away the proof of his existence, the evidence that he's actually real, hoping to spite him in some strange way. Uh, think about it. People that had uninvolved dads are kind of like agnostics. They know that they have a dad, but they don't really know what he's like. Maybe he's out there somewhere, but they've learned to live without him. They don't really care about him because he obviously doesn't care about them. People that had a mean and controlling dad, maybe they're a little like legalists. They're afraid of their dad. And so they live their life trying to please their dad by adhering to strict rules, regulations, requirements, and restrictions, and by making others do the same. They're afraid of him. Well, if you're one of those that has had a bad dad, I want you to leave with an accurate picture of God as our forever loving father this morning, described in his word. So let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And if you will stand with me, please, this morning, we're going to read briefly from Ephesians 4. And we'll discover from this and other passages three ways that God is and can be your forever father this morning. So Ephesians 4, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and I pray that from your word you would give us an accurate understanding of the loving Father that you are. The loving Father that you are to all of us, the loving Father you can be to those who believe. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The first thing I want to think about this morning is that God is our creative Father. He is our creative Father. He is our source. Ephesians 4 verse 6 says that there's one God and Father of all. How is God the Father of all? Even those who don't believe. Well, He's the creative Father of everyone. In other words, if, if He didn't make us, we wouldn't exist. Um, he's our source. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, everything that we see, hear, taste, touch, and feel came from God, the creator. In fact, he's also the reason we can see, hear, taste, touch, and feel anything. He is our source. He's our creator. He's the designer and developer of all art and ability. He's the creative father of all. Now, there are some people that don't like God, and so they've tried to present different ideas for our existence, but all of those ideas require a lot more faith, if you think about it. They believe that the intricacies of life are the result of a giant explosion in space billions of years ago, and that contrary to the law of thermodynamics, that things improve over time and evolve into more and more complex organisms until you and me arrive that everything came from nothing. That requires a lot of faith. That would be like believing that this building just came out of nowhere and from nothing. That all of these steel beams were formed perfectly and that they aligned in just the right way and that all of the sheet metal came together and that all of the fabrics that, that, that weave together and create the carpet and, and all of the elements that make up the flooring just got together in a perfect way and were perfectly symmetrical that the fabric and the wood of the pews just formed and, and created a perfect place to sit and they all just happened to be facing the right way. That's ridiculous, right? That requires more faith than believing that there was in fact an architect behind this entire process, that they actually planned everything out, that they organized the build, 
That, that they are responsible for the building that we sit in today. And that architect happens to be sitting among us this morning. Thank you, Doug, for all your hard work, by the way. I appreciate that. It's a beautiful building. But, but people that don't like God, people that, that, you know, like people that are atheists, they try to come up with ways to explain that, that we don't have a creative father, that we instead came from uh, other processes. But Genesis 1, 26 through 27 is clear. It says, then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God is our creative father. And specifically, those of us that live and breathe, those of us who are human beings, Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You see, God spoke everything else into existence, but he got dirty when he made man, right? He got down in the dirt, and he shaped us from the dust of the ground. Then he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. The Hebrew word for breath there means spirit. And so we're all different from, from God's other creations and God's other creatures because unlike everything else that he just spoke into existence, even the animals, he took time and he shaped us from the dust and he breathed his spirit. He breathed into us the breath of life and we became living beings. We were made in God's image. What does that mean? Well, the Bible here alludes to the Trinity. The word Trinity is not found in Scripture, but the concept is everywhere. It says, let us, Father, Son, Spirit, one God, eternally existing in three persons, let us make man into our image, into the image of God. God is a Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. And so man is, in the image of God, a Trinity, body, soul, and spirit. Think about it. Plants have bodies. Animals have bodies and souls, and let me clarify what I mean by soul. A soul is the mind, the will, and the emotion. Does your dog have emotions? You better believe it, right? Does he have a will? Yes. Okay. Does he have a mind? Sometimes, right? <laughs> That's what I mean by soul. So plants have bodies, animals have bodies and souls, except your cat. Your cat does not have a soul. Okay. <laughs> Cats don't have souls. Anyway. I'm biased. Plants have bodies. Animals have bodies and souls. But man is different. We're created differently. We have body, soul, and spirit. That's the place where God dwells. That's the place where we connect with God. That's what leads us to worship him. And so we're different. We were made into the image of God. We're a trinity. And, and God created us in his image, so he is our creative father. And God can legitimately say to each one of you a phrase that you've probably heard from your earthly father, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. <laughs> right? Because he is your creative father. Without him, you would not be here. And so we are all God's children by creation, but we need to be careful in thinking that way because we are not specifically God's children, okay? God is the father of all creatively, yes. But he is only an intimate father to those who by faith trust in his provision for their salvation. You see, something happened there after creation. Adam and Eve fell, didn't they? Sin came into the world and death through sin and death spread to all because all had sinned because Adam and Eve were representative of the entire human race, and so we all know the story. God put them in a perfect place with perfect provisions, and he had one reasonable rule. He said, do not eat of this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did Adam and Eve do? With the, listen, with the perfect father in the perfect place, with perfect provision, perfect fellowship, and yet they disobeyed. They disobeyed, right? Right? And by the way, dads, you could do everything just right, but your kid has a mind of his own, doesn't he? They have to make their own choice, right? And so God says, don't partake of this one tree. They disobey. But God told them, the day that you eat thereof, you will, you will die, right? Well, what happened to Adam and Eve? 
when they took a bite of that forbidden fruit, did they drop dead? No, they didn't. So what's the deal? Well, let me say this. They didn't drop dead immediately. But you remember the three parts of man, body, soul, spirit? I would say to you that spiritually they died immediately. They broke fellowship with God. At one time they were walking with him, talking with him. Now they're looking for a place to hide because they no longer had that intimate connection with God. So immediately in their spirit they died. Gradually in their soul, their mind, will, and emotion, they would die. Have you noticed that we get older and that we forget things, right? Where did I put my keys? Where's my phone? You know, I'm dying gradually in my soul. It's happening. My mind, will, and emotions is slipping. And they would die eventually in their body. Immediately in their spirit, gradually in their soul, eventually in their body. That's sin's curse. And because of sin's curse, God is our father creatively, but he's not our father in an intimate way way, the way it was in the garden back in the day, because our sin separates us from a holy God. So, because God is our creative Father, He reserves the right to judge us. I brought you into this world, I can take you out. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Him. But because of sin, we no longer can have that intimate connection with Him, unless He is also our Father, number two, redemptively. He's not only our creative Father, He can be our redemptive Father. He is not only our source, but He can also be our Savior. And that word redeem that, that I get redemptive from comes um, from the phrase to buy back. That's what it means, to buy back. And, and the term is specifically used in reference to the purchase of a slave's freedom. And since Adam and Eve fell, the human race has been enslaved to sin. We are bound by it physically, emotionally, spiritually. Everyone is in need of redemption. Everyone needs to be bought back to freedom. That's why the gospel is literally good news. Because you're telling someone who is enslaved by sin, you can be set free. That's the good news. Bad news, you're enslaved to sin. All of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. Good news, Jesus paid the price for your sins. God sent Jesus to buy back your freedom. He wants to be your redemptive father. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. It also says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or forgiveness of sin. So someone needed to shed his blood, to pay the price of sin, to buy back our freedom. It couldn't be done by a normal man because all men are sinners. All of us have sinned. It couldn't be done with just anybody's blood. It had to be an eternal sacrifice for eternal sin. And there was only one who was qualified. And his name was Jesus. The second person of the Godhead, Jesus, said, I will go. I will pay the price for man's sin because in him there was no sin. Yet he became sin for us to buy us back from slavery to sin and set us free. Colossians 1.13 says, He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. 2 Corinthians 5.17 through 21, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And verse 21 says, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through Jesus Christ, we can know our creative father as a redemptive father. You see the degrees of intimacy here? Before we just exist, now we are bought back and given freedom because of the price that he paid for us. And so those who trust in Jesus have sins cursed reversed. You remember how Adam and Eve died immediately in their spirit? They would die gradually in their soul and ultimately in their bodies. The reverse of sins cursed through faith in Jesus Christ. We are justified in our spirit immediately the moment we believe. We are sanctified in our soul gradually. And ultimately, we will be glorified in our bodies. It's the reverse of sin's curse. And so God, our creative father, can be God, our redemptive father. And that level of intimacy grows 
the benefits of redemption through Jesus include eternal life, forgiveness of sins, righteousness, freedom from the law's curse, deliverance from sins, bondage, peace with Almighty God and the indwelling Holy Spirit. All because God, our creative Father, loved us so much that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. He buys us to freedom, paying the price with His own Son. A story is told of Abraham Lincoln walking by a slave auction one day before the war, and he was appalled at what he saw. He was drawn to a young woman who was on the auction block, available to the highest bidder, and the bidding began, and Lincoln bid on her. No matter the cost, he bid until he purchased her. After he completed the transaction and paid the auctioneer, he walked over to the woman, and he says to the woman, you're free. She says, free? What is that supposed to mean? He says, it means you're free. Completely free. Doubting, she said, does this mean that I can do whatever I want? He said, yes. He said, free to do whatever you want. She said, free to say whatever I want to say? He said, yes, free to say whatever you want to say. And asking with hope and hesitation, she says, does freedom mean that I can go wherever I want to go? He said, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. You're free. And she said, then I will go with you. You see, God sets us free so that we can know him, so that we can live in relationship with him. He doesn't just want to be our creative father. He wants to be our redemptive father. He wants you to be set free from the sin that weighs you down, from the sin which causes you suffering physically, spiritually, emotionally. The story illustrates what God did for us. We were bought with a price that was very costly to God, the life of his own son. Once our new master paid the price for us, he set us free. And John 8, 36 says, so if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. God is the redemptive father of every person who's placed their faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross for their sins. But the absolute greatest benefit about knowing God as your redemptive father is that you also get to know him as your adoptive father. Number three, God is our creative father. He can be our redemptive father for all who believe. But for those of you that trust in Jesus, there's a greater level of intimacy. There's a greater level of understanding of God as your father, in that he is our adoptive father. He's our source. He's our savior. He's our sustainer. In scripture, there are many different names used to describe God. And while all the names are important in many ways, the name Abba, Father, is the most significant for me. The word Abba is the Aramaic word that means father. It was a common term. It was a common term that expressed affection and confidence and trust. Abba signifies a close, intimate relationship of a father and his child, as well as a childlike trust. It basically means daddy. Daddy. Abba is always followed by the word father in scripture. And the phrase is found in three passages. It's in Mark 14, 36 where Jesus addresses his father as Abba Father in his prayer in Gethsemane. It's in Romans 8, 15, Abba Father's mentioned in relation to the Spirit's work of adoption. Paul says to the church in Rome, he said, God has not given us the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Remember, he set us free redemptively. But he's given us the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba Father, Daddy, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We can call the creative Father of the universe Daddy because of what he's done for us through Jesus Christ. Not only do we call the King of kings and Lord of lords Father, but we inherit all that he gives to his Son. We are joint heirs with Jesus. Can you imagine today if the king called you? I, I know we still have a queen in Great Britain, but there's a king coming one day, right? She served 70 years. Wow, way to go, Queen Elizabeth. But soon we'll have a king. Can you imagine if that king called your house and said, I know you're a grown person, 
I know you probably already have earthly parents, but I would like to adopt you. And, and, and as an adoptive child in my home, you are entitled to everything that I have. You are now royalty. What's mine is yours. What I leave to my children belongs to you. I have chosen you. You might be like, why me? Because eh, I love you. Why? Well, that's just my choice. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that blow your mind? You wouldn't know what to do with yourself. And yet we have the King of Kings, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of all things, the master of the universe who says, I choose you. I want you to be a part of my family. I want to adopt you in. And I want to put a spirit in your heart that cries out, Daddy. Or he's our adoptive father. Many people claim that all people are children of God in that sense, but the Bible reveals a different truth. Yes, we are all his creation. We, he is our creative father. We are under his authority and lordship. We will be judged by him. But the right to be a child of God and call him Abba Father is something that only born-again Christians have. When we're born again, we are adopted in the family of God, redeemed by sin's curse, and made heirs of God. Part of the new relationship is that God now deals with us differently. He deals with us as family. That's a greater intimacy. It is a life-changing truth to understand what it means to be able to call the one true God Father. That's what Jesus told us to call him when we pray. Becoming a child of the Most High God is the most humbling of honors. Because of it, we have a new relationship with God, a new standing before Him. Instead of running from God, trying to hide from God in our sin like Adam and Eve, we can run to God and cry out, Abba, Father. Being an adopted child of God is the source of our hope, of our security in, in the future. It's the motivation that we have to live a life worthy of the calling, Ephesians 4.1. Calls us to a higher standard, a different way of life. And in the future, it calls us to an inheritance that is unspoiled, incorruptible, reserved in heaven for all who believe. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, begin with this phrase, our, what? Our Father art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. First John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. God is not only your source, that means without him you wouldn't be here. He is not only your savior, without the gift of his son for your sin you would not have hope for this life or the next, but he wants to be your adoptive father and intimately involved in your life. I'm going to have our musicians make their way forward as we begin our time of invitation this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, as we prepare to conclude our service. Listen, church. Don't settle for knowing God only as your creative father this morning. He made us all. He made us all. And he, he brought us into this world. He can take us out. But don't settle for that. God has designed you for so much more. He wants a relationship with you. You know, that's what real dads do. They're involved. They stick around. They're a part of the lives of their kids. And that's what God wants. He wants to have a relationship with you. He paid the price. He made the way. He sent Jesus to pay for what separates you from him. The Bible says all of us have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. And that the wages of those sins, the payments for those sins is death. But, here's the good news, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He sent Jesus, his only son, to set you free from sin so that you could be saved. But not only so you could be saved... And not face the penalty of sin so that you could have a relationship with God as Father. He's adopting you into His family. All you have to do is receive His Son, Jesus. 
Listen, my dad died 22 years ago. And there's no greater comfort to my heart than to know that God was his redemptive father and that he was a part of God's family and that one day I'll see him face to face. And I'll not only be reunited with my adopted father, but with my dad, who knows and loves God. The second greatest truth in my life is that I can call on the God of the universe as dad. People say, don't you wish you could just pick up the phone and talk to your dad? Yes, I do. But you know what? At any time, I can say the name of Jesus and be in the presence of Almighty God. I can share my heart to Him. I can ask God for wisdom, for direction, for instruction. I can share my day with Him, knowing that He loves me unconditionally and that He's here to help me. He didn't just save me and leave me. He he saved me and now He walks with me. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And one day I'll send my son and he'll come get you and bring you, and I can't wait to show you what I've prepared for you. If you don't have that hope today, today, this Father's Day, you need to trust in Jesus as your Savior. He will save you. He is everything that your earthly father was not, in a good way. You need to trust him. To you fathers out there, do you realize that God allows us to borrow his title he's allowed us to be called father let's live up to it let's walk worthy of the calling that we have been given let's be holy let's be faithful let's be loving let's be protecting let's be passionate let's reflect the father in a good way he'll help you do it he'll give you his holy spirit lean on him trust in him. Today, if you need to know Jesus as your Savior, there are pastors here across the front that would love to show you from God's Word how you can be saved. If you just want to come and spend time in prayer and ask God to help you today, walk worthy of the calling. If you just want to come and say, God, thank you that I can call you my Father. Thank you for that relationship. The altars are open. Let's do business with the Lord this morning.